Um, you have to learn how to work in that environment. But um, there was David. He was in a hostile environment, and he can't destroy it. You have to learn how to acclimate yourself when you live with sharks. You know, you've been playing in the little water with the guppies. God is calling you out of the little water. He wants you to be in the deep, which means you have to be wise. You know, when you were out in the field with David and the sheep, it was really easy to stay and do anything you wanted to do because nothing could happen to you. But now that you're with the sharks, you have to behave wisely. You have to study to be quiet. You've gone as far as you can go in your safety zone, and God is taking you out of your comfort zone. He's taking you into new dimensions, into new elements, new environments. And if you slip backwards into what you used to do, you'll disqualify yourself from going to the next level. David knew that he didn't know what he was doing, so he just kept his mouth shut in the presence of Saul. He behaved himself wisely. Um, later in the verse it says, where Saul sent him over the men of war, and all the men accepted him. And that's a miracle. Anytime somebody accepts you for who you are because they placed you there, that's a miracle. David wasn't raised in the regime. He didn't go through the military. He didn't go through any kind of specialized boot camp. But all the men accepted him because Saul set him there. Um, all of a sudden, we have David. He's in this position. He's dealing with all these men. And you'll hit a period in your life like David did. He trained that army. We don't really hear much about it, but prior to David taking over the army, they were a bunch of losers. They would lose battles. They didn't win. And David came to that army. He taught them how to be great men of war. They, they fought. They won. And that's what anointed leadership would do to you. It can take a group of losers and turn them into a group of winners. And David was in an area of his life where things just started to flow. Things were just cruising. Things were just smooth for David. Everything he wanted to do, everything he touched seemed to work. It's almost like when you're on a busy road and every light is just turning green for you, just turning green for you. You don't have to stop. David was in that. And while you're in that green light phase, you can get victory. But just because you can doesn't mean you should. If you look back with me with David, yeah, I said he's a mighty man of war. And when he would go to war, he would kill him. He would eat him up. But also, David was the type of cat. He'd be up on the mountain dancing. He'd be writing poetry, playing the harp writing songs, and just when you thought David was a punk, he'd go and pull his sword out and kill a hundred men and cut their foreskins off and throw them at the king and say, I'll kill, kill some more if you want that too. David was an extreme. He was able to do both things well. He was in control of his soft side, and he was in control of his soft side. He was lamb enough to follow and to lay down, but he was also lion enough to fight and to lead. He was a perfect balance between the two. And you have to learn how to be what you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be it. Like I said, David does both things well. And God was letting David know, now's the time to keep quiet just so you can win. So it doesn't matter how well you fight. It only matters that you win. So sometimes your greatest strength is in your silence. The ability to know when to hold your peace and the ability to know when to shout out. And this was the ability that David had. He knew when to be quiet around Saul, and he knew when to go out to war. And when David came back from leading the men to war, um, they came back from the battle, jacked everybody up, did what they had to do. And that's the time when Saul was really offended because you had a group of women saying, Saul had killed his thousands and David killed his ten thousands. That was a very awkward time for David. He was being praised by one, but he knew that he was being hurt by another. And let me tell some of you right now that you're playing a losing hand. You know, you're in a situation that won't work, a marriage that won't work, a job that's not working. Maybe you're a single mother and it's not working. But if you gave somebody else your hand and let them play it, they would turn it into a winning hand. If you don't believe me, just walk away from your hand and you'll find yourself looking at somebody who's taken your hand and won. So because of the favor and the success that was on his life, it breeded an equal opposite reaction of hatred and cynicism, excuse me, of cynicism. So before you go any further in life, you need to decide, can you stand to be blessed? Are you willing to have the heat of winning on you? Are you strong enough to be successful? 
If you think it's hard to fail, it's really hard to succeed because it never ends. People will just hate you because of who you are. You have to be tenacious. You have to be relentless enough to stand there and look them in the face, let them say or do what they want to say, and walk away. The Bible says that Saul eyed David. And David, knowing that he didn't do anything wrong, he just would see Saul sitting over in the corner just looking at him mean, making faces. Can you stand to have somebody close to you just stare at you and talk about you, give you the evil eye? Success makes you controversial. People think you're going to leave them. You know, that's one of the biggest things that people begin to think about. They're like, they'll hate you and they'll think you're going to leave them. And as long as we're all sitting around drinking together, as long as we're all catching the bus together, as long as we're all eating Raymond noodles with cut up hot dogs in it, <laughs> we're all, everybody's happy. But the moment you start getting yourself up, the moment you start eating healthy meals, the moment you start speaking in complete sentences, that's the moment that they'll start to change on you. So anytime somebody hates you, like Saul hated David, he'll send out a certain spirit, a certain aura, a certain aroma. Not necessarily what he say, but it's something that you'll feel. The hairs on the back of your neck will stand up, and you'll know that everybody in the room is not with you. And that's why you'll begin to understand, that's why God anointed you, so that you can live in that environment that he set you in. So that even if the enemy is sending out spirits, your Holy Spirit is a secret weapon. It's your equalizer. You have to pray as you journey up that God will equalize you and balance you against the opposition that awaits you. There's a reason that you're here today. There's a reason that we're talking about this message today. God is getting ready to exalt you to the next level. He's getting ready to move you to another dimension in life. God has us in boot camp today. He's got you in Holy Ghost training. He's getting your mind set. He's getting your back straight. He's telling you, keep your head up. Reach out and tell three people, I'm changing. I'm changing. I'm changing. Prepare yourself because I'm changing. Buckle your seatbelt up because I'm changing. One of the most liberating things you can do is begin to announce to people that I'm changing. The first thing they'll do, they'll try to tell you that you're changing. They'll use it against you. They don't mean it to, for complimentary purposes. They mean it to hurt you. But I say beat them to it. Tell them that I'm changing. You know, how dare you define my today by my yesterday? Of course, if you don't know what to do, you'll find yourself starting to defend yourself, saying that, you know what, I haven't changed. You know, I'm still the same person. And you'll stop being focused on what God has called you to do and find yourself moving backwards instead of forward, trying to prove to them that you're still the same person. And no matter what you do, they're not going to like you. So rather than spend another second of my life trying to convince you that I've changed, I'm going to keep moving forward. So since I already know you're watching me, I already know that all eyes are on me, I've changed. Just go ahead and tell them, I've changed. Get used to it. The old me is gone. New me is here. I've changed. Anything that don't change won't grow. Anything that don't change won't move. Anything that won't change won't progress. And people who will not change become traditional. And tradition is the enemy of revelation. It stops you from greatness. It locks you into dead systems. You'll be surprised at what people start to do to protect their tradition. If you just think about the Catholic Church and what the priests have gone through for all those years, all they want to do is just sweep it under the rug and pretend like it didn't happen. They'll do anything to protect tradition. But I say get rid of tradition. As the tree falls, so shall it lie. Let God be true and every man a liar. If the word kills a man, let him die. If you're wrong, you're just wrong. So especially when it comes to messing with, with my babies, how dare you try to let a traditional thing try to protect six years old, six year old, seven year old, eight year old little boys, allow the tradition to go away and stand up and fight against it. God didn't call you to fit in. He called you to stir some stuff up. One of the things that cause people to be cynical or egotistical is that they get to the point in their lives where they're not flowing. And because they're not flowing, they don't want you to flow either. Saul had his chance to be king. He was the king, and he blew his chance and didn't want David to be the king. 
Some of the most dangerous people you'll ever have to work with are the people who almost. It's like they almost made it, but they didn't. And because they'll hate you for taking advantage of an opportunity, 